So, uh, welcome. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad we're here. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in the South, grew up in, at First Raven Church in Greensboro. It's always good uh, to be back in the South. Um, the other day, at, um, it was just this week, um, at the seminary in a meeting, because I'm surrounded by people from the North, and uh, we have a, the assistant director of seminary administration, his name's Rachel Starmer, who grew up in Chapel Hill. And somebody said, do you think we can get this done in a week? And she said, we might could do that. I said, Mike could. <laughs> it's, I'm back, back home. So um, it, it, it's nice to be back in the world of Mike could and should, should could and <laughs> might should and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, one of the things I noted uh, on, on the exit door there, out that way is a sign that says you are now entering the mission field, which is a helpful reminder. Um, Chaz said that sign predates him here, but it's a good reminder for us all that whatever we do here, uh, that there's a world uh, beyond these walls that um, uh, we can bring the good news to. So just wanted to say that. Um, uh, you, you might note that I have a water bottle here and that Audrey and I will probably both be drinking out of. We did this once at uh, a, a retreat at Laurel Ridge, and somebody came up and said, you know, my husband and I have separate toothpaste tubes. <laughs> so that was really freaky for us. So we're, we'll try not to freak anybody out, but we might be drinking out, out of the same bottle. <clears throat> um, Audrey's going to say some things uh, when, uh, in her section of the first lecture. We'll say some more things about herself. And... Um, Monitors, the, uh, there's a PowerPoint, or it's not a PowerPoint, it's a keynote, but anyway, same thing. That'll go up on those monitors, and I noted sitting there that that sign there, uh, so, huh? You have to turn your head to the right. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so can y'all read that over there? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, like it says, uh, called in faith to do what? is uh, what we're uh, looking at this morning and a little bit this afternoon. Uh, one of the biggest points of conflict among Moravians these days, and not just among Moravians, but among um, uh, Christians in general and society in general, uh, centers on the question of what we should do or should not do. It's not as much these days questions of what should we believe or what should we think, um, but more about how we treat certain kinds of people or different kinds of people or any kind of people who we welcome, who we ex exclude, who we invite in, who we include, uh, what actions are acceptable or unacceptable. Th those are the questions that occupy us virtually everywhere we go, every context in which we uh, find ourselves on any given day. So we're going to solve all those questions today, uh, <laughs> thankfully. Aren't you glad? You're here. I, I wish. Um, I, I, don't, I can't guarantee that. But we are going to look at some ways, like Ruth said, that uh, the Mara some uh, general ways the Moravian Church has approached uh, these kinds of questions over the years. Look at a little bit from the ground of the unity. Um, not surprisingly, in the end, this is the spoiler alert. It's, it has something to do with Jesus and the Bible. So uh, we'll be looking at that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so I'm not going to lay out what all we're going to be doing, but uh, th that will unfold fold as we go through. So first, just the general framework out of the ground of the unity. Here's the general framework that's deceptively simple. Um, it's three sentences from the early paragraphs of the ground of the unity. Here's the first one. Uh, the Unitas Fratrum is aware of its being called in faith to serve humanity by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we've already answered the title of the day, called in faith to do what? Um, that. Uh, called in faith to serve humanity by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, at the core of our life as Moravians, uh, at the very center of what we do, uh, the most essential aspect of our lives is to know that the triune God, um, you're probably familiar with this, uh, the triune God creates, saves, and transforms us and uh, so that we might serve God and humanity with acts of faith, hope, and love. So that, that's, those are the essentials of the Moravian Church, um, and, and this is um, 
this is in this framework. The triune God, as revealed in the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only source of our life and salvation. And this scripture is the sole standard of the doctrine and faith of the Unitus Fratrum, and therefore shapes our life. So, um, what does it mean to say scripture is the sole standard, the sole standard? Uh, we'll look at that uh, a little bit today. Um, scripture itself doesn't necessarily hold itself as the sole standard because people learn from their experience. They learn from scripture, they learn from experience, they learn from the Holy Spirit, they learn from re revelation. But since all of those are in scripture, we can say that therefore that's <laughs> the sole standard of our life. So um, we'll, we'll come to that later. Um, but uh, the idea of what it means to have our lives shaped by Scripture, th that, that's mainly why we're here. What does it mean and how do we go about being open to the ways that Scripture uh, can, can shape us? Um, and one thing that's key to having lives that are shaped by Scripture rather than just by human traditions or rather than just by what we're used to and comfortable with, or what we've always known, is to embody the following rather radical uh, transformative approach to life and faith, also from the ground of the unity. It sounds pretty simple, but it, it's pretty surprising. But it's in there. Paragraph five. The, the Unitas Fratrum maintains that all creeds formulated by the Christian church stand in need of constant testing in the light of the Holy Spirit. So all the creeds need testing in light of Scripture? I mean, who do those Moravians, or who do we Moravians, uh, think we are? Uh, testing the creeds, the Nicene Creed, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, or the Apostles' Creed, the sort of shorter version, although earlier in time. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, etc., through all the different parts. Really? We we're testing that. Um, and I think part of the reason that we say that, that we test them, is also in that sentence it says, all creeds formulated by the Christian church, th this is, the creeds represent our understanding of the message that, and the story, the history uh, that we're part of. And we formulated the creeds. Hopefully God had some hand in that. But it's um, the fact that uh, we formulated them uh, means we need to test them in light, in light of Scripture. So um, uh, <clears throat> what that means is we don't have to stick with what we've always thought, even what we've always believed, or even what we've always done. Um, but uh, as Jesus said, the Spirit will lead us into all truth beyond things we weren't able to hear before. Um, this is, Moravians have this openness at our best to whatever new thing God's going to tell us to do or lead us to do. Um, and so uh, when push comes to shove, even if it's something where you really used to and really like, maybe it'll have to go. Uh, which doesn't mean everything we think and do is so dispensable we can just lightly cast it aside. But um, the whole history of the Christian church or the whole history of the people of God or the whole history of humans um, is this constant decision. What do I hang on to and what do I set aside and move into a new direction? So um, this, uh, that uh, guiding principle, those guiding principles say that our main guide is uh, Scripture. And uh, just not to proof text, but um, although that is a time-honored tradition in the life of, of the church, but... Um, <laughs> So I'll prove text. Um, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise the works of the prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. This idea of testing everything. Um, or from 1 John, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So like I say, the challenge for the people of God has always been sorting out the messages we hear, the things we see, uh, what should be guiding us. And these verses 
are from the first century. So what we're talking about today is not a new thing. It's not new to our generation. And when people say to me, and I feel this way sometimes myself, I've never seen things so bad as they are today. And in many ways, I've never seen things as bad as they are today. At the same time, every generation has said that, which doesn't diminish how bad it is now, but it just says every generation has to, has to come to terms uh, with the times in which they live. Um, and so how does scripture shape us during the things that we uh, confront in our lives or that confront us in our lives? So um, <clears throat> anybody have any comments or questions or objections or anything so far? When you say open, yeah, 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 and just like the creeds, so it's been revised a couple of times, yeah, or at least once. The sentence that said the the Christian church. Mm -hmm. When was that part of it? In other words, are they talking about the Catholic Church at that point? Uh, The creeds. No, it says Christian church in your previous slide. Oh. All creeds formulated by the Christian church? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, when was that written? So, so when you look at the, um, in, in the ground of the unity, it lists, these are articles of faith that we hold to. And some of them are Roman Catholic, some of them are creedal, some of them are Lutheran, some are Anglican. So it spans, it spans from early, early church to like, uh, I think even the Declaration of Barman, which is a 20th century uh, thing is, is in there too. So it, so these are all things formulated over the centuries by the church, creeds being the earliest. But there are creeds that are in conflict with each other. Correct. So when someone wrote that, where, where were they in time? When somebody wrote that statement, they were in 1957. Okay, that's where it was. Yep, yep. 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 That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and with the awareness that uh, all those different confessions come in conflict, they're from different denominations emerge out of these different confessions that wouldn't see them as necessarily compatible. But Moravian say, eh, there's a lot of stuff in there that we can live with <laughs> um, together. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to say a couple basic things about scripture. Some of this may seem like really basic, so I apologize if it's too basic, but here's a good reminder. Um, I think if I can get this to come up. How many of you go to a church that every Sunday reads all three lessons of the lectionary, Old Testament, Epistle, and Gospel? Okay, so not everybody in here raised their hand, and I've asked that in any number of groups, and sometimes almost nobody raises their hand. It's just helpful to remember uh, that the scriptures of the church are Old Testament and New Testament. And so, okay, and the psalm probably. Yeah, so yeah. So, you, so what, where, what, church, what church is that? Trinity. Oh, okay. So, um, Y'all are the exception, I, I think. Um, uh, but uh, it, it is Old Testament and New Testament. There are uh, 66 books. There's 39 Old Testament, 27 New. A lot of different authors, three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, um, written for many different audiences over a span of at least seven to 800 years, if not 1,000. And all the books in our scriptures are two to 3,000 years old. Um, and so uh, we'll talk about this um, uh, a number of times, but although Scripture speaks to us today, it's helpful to remember it was written first for them, whoever they were, back two or 3,000 years ago. And, and so we have this gap of history and culture and time to bridge when we sit down to read Scripture and, and, and uh, try to be open to having it shape our lives. So um, we'll look at that. Uh, a lot of times just simple little things about what does this word mean 
um, uh, can, can play a, a gigantic role. Now the American Bible Society website gives, um, gives different kinds of writings in the Bible. It's also helpful to remember uh, they're all different kinds. And we're going to, today, uh, <coughs> we grouped them into two groups that's not in the American Bible thing. They just have one list. But here's, here's, our, here's our group grouping. Uh, there's writings that are like instructions and commandments. And that includes things like laws and rules, wisdom sayings and proverbs, prayers, it had to fit in somewhere. It fits better than it did the second category. Moral, philosophical, theological reflections, and prophetic writings. Um, so uh, there's, on the one hand, you've got that kind of writing, and, uh, oh yeah, letters too. And on the other hand, you've also got narratives and stories. So these are two really rough, sort of mark with chalk, cut with an ax kind of um, unnuanced way to... Uh, look at them. Gospels, parables, uh, history, poetry and songs, apocalyptic writings like the book of Revelation or uh, different parts of some of the prophetic writings, and genealogies. And some of those genealogies, the stories behind them are pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, <clears throat> but we don't read all of those different kinds of writings the same way. Um, because uh, instructions and commandments convey their meaning differently from how stories and narratives convey their meaning. And so Audrey is going to uh, lead us in an experience of um, a scripture to open up our awareness of how we read scripture, how we hear it, how we respond, some of the challenges of understanding it, and also some of the ways scripture opens up its meanings to us. So I'm going to turn it over to Audrey West. So before we uh, look at the passage that we're going to do this morning, um, just a couple words of, by way of introduction uh, so that you are forewarned. Um, in a previous life, before I ever went to seminary, I was a swimming coach. And I coached little kids, swim team little kids, which means I spent a lot of hours at the side of the pool doing this. Kick your feet. <laughs> Don't forget to breathe. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> and so what that means is some of my first experiences of teaching involved walking around a lot. And so um, I have trouble standing behind the podium. I move a lot. And I promise you, I'm really not checking up to see if you're on Facebook or <laughs> sending emails to your friends or anything like that. It's just how I operate, okay? Maybe I'm hyperactive or something, I'm not really sure. Um, but So you need to know that about me. The other thing that I always feel like I need to tell folks um, is that I'm a native Californian. And that means two things. One, as my family discovered when they all traveled to North Carolina for our wedding, I, we out there in California, we speak with an accent. <laughs> so sometimes that makes it difficult for folks to understand me when I'm in other parts of the country, right? Uh, we have lots of stories about that in our two families, each of us trying to communicate in our families with each other. Um, but the other thing that uh, it means, the fact that I'm from California, is it gives you an easy out. If I say something up here that you think is just totally wacky, you can just blame it on the fact that I'm from Northern California. All right. So, um, so what, uh, what we're going to do just for the next uh, short little while is look at one of Jesus' parables uh, I'm going to read it for you, and then I'm going to ask you to engage it in some different kinds of ways. And so I'm hoping that some of you might be willing to actually talk to each other, and then perhaps talk to me as well. All right, so gear up. I promise I will not force anyone to speak in public. All right, but I will ask for your input, and I would love to hear it. All right. So um, this parable that we're going to look at this morning um, appears in a couple of the Gospels. I'm going to read it from the Gospel of Matthew, but I'm not going to tell you where it is. 
so that those of you who have a Bible won't go looking it up. I want you just to hear it. Because when Jesus told parables to his followers and the folks who gathered around him, they heard these stories. They didn't have a text in front of them where they could go back and look it up and check back for what he said and, you know, did they really get it. So we're just going to practice hearing um, a couple of parables and then I'm going to ask you some questions. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will pro proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. Okay, what I'd like to ask you to do now is turn your chairs or turn your bodies enough so that two or three of you can talk and listen to each other. And in each one of your little groups, I would like one person to tell the parable of the yeast. Just retell the parable of the yeast. And I want everybody else just to listen and attend to what they tell you. And then I'm gonna have you do some more stuff, all right? So just find a couple people. If you don't know who's sitting next to you, introduce yourselves. And uh, just one person volunteer to tell the parable. This is not a test, it's just a little exercise. Okay, I'm going to read the parable of the yeast again. And uh, I want you to listen closely to the details this time. And I'm going to ask you, what did your teller leave out? Or what did your teller put in when they told the parable, all right? Um, this will become clear as we move our way. I'm, can, will it work if I move this forward a little bit? The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. There's the parable. Is there anybody in here who told the parable without saying the kingdom of heaven? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. Is there anybody in here who told the parable and forgot the yeast? We all remembered the yeast. Okay, I'm gonna put it over here. It's yeast that a woman took. Did anybody tell the parable and say, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that someone took and mixed in with flour? Anyone say someone or a person or, yeah, okay. She took it and she mixed it in with three measures of flour. Did anyone say anything other than mixed in? Did you say she put it in, she stuck it in, she... Hmm. There's a nod saying, yeah, maybe, I don't really remember, I'm not exactly sure, okay. Three measures of flour. Did everybody say three measures? Did anyone say three cups or some flour or a pile of flour or a bowl of flour? Some flour, okay. Everybody probably got flour though, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh! oh. <laughs> Somebody got ahead of the game and turned it into dough. Okay, the, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Did anyone say anything else? Like she had a big pile of dough or there was bread, lots of bread. 
After a while, it was leaven. After a while, it was leaven. So you added in a time frame? Okay. Um, so in addition to the time frame, did everybody get all of it was leavened, or did anyone say something else? Risen. risen. It was all risen. Yeah, that, that works. Okay. Okay, so I just want to point out that in our collective omissions, in our collective omissions, here's our parable. The <laughs> is like yeast that a <laughs> took and <laughs> with <laughs> of flour until all of it was leavened. That's our collective omissions. We left out a number of details, right? So before we go any further, I just want to tell you, you performed better on that little exercise than most groups that I have done this with, and I've done this a zillion times all around the country. Nola has been with a group that I did this with. I won't tell you who they were, <laughs> because you did better than they did too. Um, so I commend you for remembering the yeast and remembering that all of it was leavened in our collective retelling. Now what I'd like to do is go back and look at some of these details in this parable. But before I do, I want everybody just to take a moment and think to yourself, you don't have to share this with anyone, but just think to yourself, what does this parable mean? What does it mean? Okay, so everybody kind of has something in mind that the parable means. Now let's look at the details. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. So Jesus said to his followers when he announced um, he was coming on the scene, the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is among you. Jesus taught lots of things about the kingdom of heaven. One piece I want to just highlight for a second is this word kingdom. You want to learn a little Greek? Are you up for some Greek? I teach Greek at the seminary, at Moravian Seminary, and we have class in the afternoon, which is a terrible time to try to, try to learn Greek because everybody's falling asleep. The Greek word for kingdom is basileia. Basileia. Everybody try to say that. Basileia. The basileia, the kingdom of heaven. And it's easy to think of the kingdom of heaven as a place, you know, like you go there somehow. But really, in the New Testament, and actually in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven doesn't refer so much to a place as it does to the way that God reigns. Okay, it's the kind of, it's the kind of way that God's, that is God's way. Okay, so it's not a place, it's more of a quality of life, a quality of experience, a quality of what it is to be encompassed by God. Okay? So it's a reign of God or the way, the way of God might be another way to think about it too. All right? Now, the, so the way of God is like yeast. I'm going to come back to the yeast. This, this turns out to be a pretty significant detail in the parable, but I want to hold on to it for a minute and first talk through the parts that we left out. The way of God is like yeast that a woman took. And the reason that I called out the woman is, first of all, because there's not a lot of parables that have women as the star character, right? So when we see them, it's good to lift them up and to remember that these, that the Gospels in which Jesus' parables appear, the Gospels were written most likely by men, but they preserved stories that Jesus told that were also about women because women and men, all people were encompassed in Jesus' ministry. So Jesus tells this parable about a woman to tell us something about the way of God. 
But it's not the only time. There's other parables that you might remember that Jesus talks about that use women. Uh, do you remember the parable of the lost coin? And the woman who sweeps everywhere to find her one coin out of the ten um, that she lost. And do you remember what she does when she finds it? She throws a big party, invites all of her friends and neighbors to come. Uh, and that parable is connected up with the parable of the lost sheep and also the parable that we might call the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son. Okay. Uh, there's other places where um, women play key roles. There's one other parable that I thought of, uh, and that's uh, when Jesus... Um, laments over Jerusalem and oh Jerusalem how I've longed to gather you beneath my wings as a mother hen gathers her chicks right so we have that kind of an image as well so we lift those up when we can to remind folks that all of us are being included in the picture that Jesus paints of what is the way of God yeah is that women do the cleaning, they do the bread making, they do the child care. Not as inclusive of women, but as saying a man wouldn't do that. So it's, it actually, actually, that's a really great insight because it's important to remember that these parables were told into a cultural context yes. that had certain expectations or kind of general ways that people operated. So you're right. They use parables that describe women's activity, giving birth, um, sweeping the floor, making bread. You know what's interesting? All over the Bible, it talks about Jesus, or about God creating the earth, giving birth to the earth. The language often in the Bible is the God who births creation. We tend not to think of that necessarily in female terms because our history has long identified God people call God he. So we tend to not recognize that. But we actually have this kind of encompassing of the of this typical activities that are women's and men's activities uh, throughout the whole Bible. So you're right. It's also inclusive because, and the reason that I say that is because in uh, the Gospel of Luke where these parables tend to appear that have women in key roles, Luke is the gospel that frequently shows women being crucial to the ministry of Jesus. They support his ministry. They provide food and lodging for him. They're called disciples in, in parts of the gospel. So the women are being um, included in the ministry of Jesus and among the closest followers of Jesus. And then he's telling these stories, too, that incorporate women into those roles. So I would say my own response would be that both things are the case. And you may see it differently. But thank you, because it's a great insight about the stereotype activity. OK, she mixed it in. You want to learn a little more Greek? The Greek word here is encrypto. Encrypto. When I was, a, I'm going to date myself here, but when I was a kid, they used to have stuff in cereal boxes. You know, like at the bottom of the box, there would be some little ring. tree. Yeah, and sometimes they would have these secret decoder rings. So on the, on the outside of the cereal box, there's some message written in code. And then you, you dig down through the box of cereal and you get your little decoder ring and it tells you how to translate the code, right? And the code is encrypted, and the decoder ring decrypts it. Okay? So encrypt, encrypt in Greek means pretty much the same thing it does in English. That is to hide. So the way of God is like yeast that a woman took and hid. She hid it. That's an important detail, and we're going to come back to it. Okay, she didn't just stir it in. She hid it. And she hid it in three measures of flour. Usually when I tell this parable, people think of cups. You know, you dump three cups of flour in there, and you put some yeast in. 
three measures, the Greek word that's used for three measures stands for the equivalent of 50 or 60 pounds of flour. So at my little bread machine, I can make like a two pound loaf in my little bread machine and I buy bread in little five pound packages. That's kind of the grocery store size, you know, about like that. So five pounds is like that. So 10 or 12 of those amounts of flour, that's how much flour this parable is talking about. Now I want you to picture in your head how big the bowl has to be. <laughs> it's ginormous. I mean, you couldn't actually lift a bowl big enough for 50 or 60 pounds of flour. But that's what Jesus is saying in this parable. The way of God is like yeast that a woman took and hid in 50 or 60 pounds of flour until all of it was leavened. All of it was yeasted, is what the Greek says. All of it was yeasted. Now I want to go back to the yeast. For my little bread machine, when I go to the grocery store to buy yeast, I can get it in a jar, or I can get it in those little packets, you know, and it's that powdery stuff. You kind of sprinkle it in. They didn't have that back in the time of Jesus, which I'm sure you realize. They didn't have little packets of yeasty things. The way they made bread was the same way that we make sourdough today. If you make authentic sourdough and don't start it with a little packet. And that is this, you mix together some flour and a little bit of sugar and some water and you stir it up and you put it inside of a jar and then you leave it uncovered someplace in your kitchen, outside on the backyard, wherever. Back in the first century, it probably would have been outside. You leave your jar of flour, water, and sugar out, open to the air, and then all the little yeasty things that are just kind of in the air around fall into the jar. And if you're lucky, you'll get a bubbling, fermented mass, and it won't turn slimy and purple because slimy purple is not so good for sourdough. If any of you have ever made sourdough, slimy purple is bad. But you get this gooey mass of sourdough, and then you can take that sourdough and you can use it to make yeasted or leavened bread. Or you can take some more, put it in another jar, and pass it along to your neighbor. Some of you might have done the friendship sourdough thing, right? So, when Jesus' parable says that the woman took yeast, we need to picture in our heads the same thing that first century people would have pictured. She took a lump of sourdough, okay? She took a lump of sourdough and hid it in all of that flour. Yeast here has a very interesting picture. If we look at this parable in the context of the whole Bible, if we, if we try to understand what yeast is talking about or how biblical writers used the image of yeast, we get a kind of an interesting picture. And I want to I want to read to you a couple of passages. If I write the references down here, can you see? If I write down here, can not so well. Okay, let me start. So Exodus 12, 15, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven yeast from your houses, for whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh shall be cut off from Israel. This is the teaching about the Passover. You remember during the Passover when Moses is leading all the people out of Egypt and they have to go quickly, and so you're not supposed to take any leavened stuff, you only take unleavened bread with you because you don't have time, you gotta get out of there. Um, and so this passage from Exodus is a teaching that's related to the Passover. Leviticus chapter two, verse 11. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. 
For you must not turn any leaven or honey into smoke as an offering for the Lord. So there's a whole list of things you bring, like various kinds of meat, various kinds of young calves, birds, etc. But no leaven. You're not supposed to bring leaven or anything that's leavened as your offering uh, at the time of the sacrifice. So these Old these are, it's all over the Old Testament, but these are two that are representative. From the New Testament, we have Luke chapter 12, verse 1. I know that you know this one. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. That is their hypocrisy. And elsewhere, he includes the scribes. Beware the yeast of the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay. And from 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8. Your boasting is not a good thing, Paul writes. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch, as you really are unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb Christ has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but when the, with the unleavened bread of sincerity or truth. So that representative sample of verses from throughout the Bible, based on that, would your hunch be that, generally speaking, leaven is used in a positive sense? Or does it tend to be used in a negative sense? Negative, right? So now let's hear the parable. The way of God is like a contaminating lump of sourdough that a woman took and hid in 50 or 60 pounds of flour until the whole thing was leavened. A contaminating lump of sourdough. That's the way the Bible tends to talk about yeast. And the way of God is like a contaminating lump of sourdough that a woman took and hid 50 or 60 pounds of flour till the whole thing was leavened. Let's talk a little bit about contaminating lumps of sourdough, because that's a tough image to wrap our heads around, right? The way of God is a contaminating lump of sourdough. So we're supposed to go viral? Go viral. <laughs> yeah, that would be a contemporary way to talk about it. Yeah. So let's think about that for a second. Um, contamination. Anybody have insurance riders for mold in your house? You know, like you don't want to have mold growing in the wrong place in your house. It's not a good thing. Mold. It's... It takes over everywhere. You think you've scrubbed it out and it just keeps going, right? It's contamination, mold, not a good thing. Any of you ever had an antibiotic from your doctor? You know that penicillin was developed from a particular kind of mold, right? Every time we get penicillin pills or a shot of penicillin, we're depending on somebody who figured out that mold doesn't just spread everywhere, but it also has the possibility of doing, of, of life, giving life, right? Anybody ever worn a pearl? You know how pearls get made. A little contaminating bit of sand gets inside the oyster and the oyster goes, yeah. I'm not really sure I like how that feels. And the oyster adjusts and does what oysters do and eventually you end up with a beautiful pearl that has been generated by this contaminating piece of sand. So the way of God, Jesus says, is like a contaminating lump of sourdough that a woman took and hid in 50 or 60 pounds of flour till the whole thing was leavened. Now, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that at least one or more of these details challenges or opens up or adjusts or whatever to your original expectation of what you thought the parable meant. 
I'm just guessing because we didn't talk about it for sure. But most of us, when we hear that parable, tend to think kind of like the mustard seed. Little bitty mustard seed grows into a big plant. Little bit of yeast grows into a whole lot of dough. That's usually how we think of it. Little gets to big. And that's fine. And that's right. And there's so much more there. There's so much more there that we have to work a little bit to uncover because we don't live in the first century when Jesus is telling these parables. We have a long distance in history and time. We don't speak the same language that the New Testament is written in or the language that Jesus himself spoke. And so we have to depend on translators to help us out. Or if we can read Greek or Hebrew, then we can read it directly. But we have to do a little bit more work. The word can do its thing regardless, regardless. And the word can do its thing and we can, can live it more richly and more fully when we dig in and really attend to the details of what the words mean, when we look at the whole picture of what it might have meant in the first century, when we understand it in the context of the whole biblical witness, the biblical testimony, all of these things increase our understanding and help to lead us into the way of God, the reign of God, God's desire for us and for the whole creation. Okay, I need to stop there because I need to let Frank say a few more things. But let me just hear if there's any questions or comments or pushback or whatever. Yes, please. Uh, John Sensbach tells the story of a, Moravian, of a slave in the West Indies who was taught to read using the New Testament and came to the Gospel of John and found faith in a way that prepared her to hear the message of a Moravian missionary. Huh. And there followed an amazing life. But this idea of the kingdom happening without human agency, uh, could I just mention, and you would mention this normally also, but that it's also in the parable of the growing seed. Yes. Do you want to say some more about that? Can I just read it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He also said the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep, rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes with his sickle because the harvest has come. Yeah, thank you for that, because it's a really nice parallel kind of idea parallel of the hiddenness of God's work, that yeast does its thing apart from us as it floats into the, bear, the bucket, you know, of the water and sugar and all that kind of stuff. It does its thing in the bread, and we don't always see it happening. Like the person who goes to sleep at night and everything is growing and the gardener or the tender doesn't even necessarily know about it. We don't always see immediately what God is doing and the inbreaking of God's reign or the way that God is doing it. It's not always completely obvious to us because God is often working in hidden, in hidden ways apart from whatever we are doing because God's desire, God's way is going to do God's thing. Um, and, and thank you for that. I really appreciate that parallel in there. And we, I'm sure that we could expand it considerably. Um, thank you. The, the new piece that I got uh, from your explanation is that I would have um, originally read this parable thinking, yeast is a really good thing, and it's going to do a really good thing all around it. You know, if you insert yeast into something, it's going to affect it. <laughs> But with the idea that it's a really good thing that everybody likes, I, I see it here that um, there could be an idea that people are very 
what we think about that. Or there could be some people with some ideas. We don't really know the best what. And they too uh, can positively end mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. affecting all around if they are allowed to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. There are so many things that we could say about this parable. I love working with this parable because it's so short, but it's so rich, too. Um, but we have to stop because we want to keep moving. Um, and we're going to do another exercise in a little bit. But I'm going to turn this over to Frank and let him take over the mic. And uh, I think I might have used up more time than I was supposed to.